we've already discussed how linear approximations are quite limited in their accuracy. And I've also demonstrated to you what a graph of a function with its linear approximation looks like, as well as what a quadratic and a cubic and a quartic approximation looks like, and a few others. And we've noticed already that the higher the power of the polynomial, the more accurate, or over a longer period of time, or a longer stretch of values, the more accurate the approximation of the polynomial is to the actual function. So what we're going to do in this section is we're going to take a look at one step up from where we were in the last section. Quadratic approximations are slightly better than linear approximations. So let's start with a quick review of quadratic equations so that I can demonstrate to you how much you already know about these functions. Here's a generic quadratic equation. Well, it's not exactly generic. I've chosen it for a reason. One of the things we can very quickly figure out here is what h of 0 is. It's 200. We get that just by plugging 0 in for all of our t's. We're not told anything about what it is that brought this quadratic equation to our attention, but we might be able to surmise something. h is usually used to represent height, and t is frequently used for time. So if what we're looking at here is a standard representation, then we might be saying that the height of an object after t, I don't know, seconds, minutes, let's say seconds for now, the height of an object after t seconds is given by this function, given by this expression. If we know the time is 0, then we can just replace t with 0, and we get 0 for these two terms and 200, uh, 200 for h of 0. That means the object is at a height of 200, what, feet, meters? Why don't we say meters? The, the object is a, at a height of 200 meters after 0 seconds, or as it begins whatever path it's going to go on. If we graph this function, we'll get something that looks like this. We already know that h of 0 is 200. And I happen to know from having worked with this graph before that the, the maximum is actually up here somewhere. It's to the left of 0. We're not really all that interested in what's going on to the left of 0. We'll assume for the moment that the scenario is something along the lines of something gets thrown or something is on a projectile path uh, beginning at 200 feet. And when it lands, it does so after about 3.2 seconds. So this is my time, this is my height in terms of time. I can also tell a few things from the quadratic equation itself, from this right-hand expression here. I can tell that the parabola that uh, is the graph of this thing is going to open downward because I have a, a leading negative term. Um, I can tell, because I know that what, when I plug in 0 I'm going to get 200, I can tell what its initial position is, it's 200 feet. I can also tell what its initial velocity is. And I can tell that that's negative 10, but here's why I can tell that. Um, years of experience and knowing that velocity is the first derivative of position, I get negative 32t minus 10. And the, the velocity at time 0 is going to be equal to negative 10. So I know that at time 0, when I plug a 0 in for t, I'm going to be left with just negative 10. So that's my initial velocity. Let's put that over here as well. Initial position is 200. Initial velocity is negative 10. Now the second uh, derivative is acceleration. I take this, this, the first derivative of this function, I get negative 32. And that is my initial acceleration, if you will. Well, I, can, I can get that from the first derivative term as well because I'm, I need to, I know I need to take the second derivative of this. So I'm going to multiply this by 2 and then multiply it by 1. And I'm going to multiply that by this negative 16 to get the negative 32. And negative 32 is not terribly surprising because in terms of feet per second, this, this would be the acceleration due to gravity in feet per second. Um, I said over here, let's assume we're in meters, but looking at this, I'm, I'm pretty sure this equation is probably been derived from a feet per second situation. Well, my point in doing all of this really was to was to help you realize how much we already know about quadratic equations. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this quadratic equation in a slightly different form. I'm going to write it as 200 minus 10t minus 16t squared. 
It's exactly the same quadratic equation. I've just reordered the terms. Addition is commutative, so I'm allowed to get away with that. But here's the thing I really want you to notice. This part right here is a line. And so I can, I can approximate this quadratic, right, this curve here, with this line for certain values of t. But I don't need to because I have, I have the other term as well. Now, we don't always have this, but we can come up with one in the same way that we've come up with a linear approximation. We can come up with a formula for quadratic approximations. And that's what we're going to do next. Back in the previous section, we talked about this linear approximation formula. We said that the equation of a line was equal to mx plus b. This is my constant b. And that the actual function we were given could be approximated by that line, that same line, as long as we included that there, in order for this to be equal, there must be some error, some element of error taken into consideration. Now, if we notice that the linear approximation has a first derivative and a power of one in the x, then it might not be too much of a stretch to realize that a quadratic approximation would be the same as the linear approximation plus some function that has some, some term that has a second power of x and a second derivative in it. And this isn't too far off the mark. One thing we haven't considered yet is whether or not some of these might have some constant in front of them. And as it, as it turns out, they do. As it turns out, in the case of both of these first terms, for, so, so for the case of linear approximation, both of these first terms have a constant of 1, a coefficient of 1. But the second uh, derivative term and the second power term does not. Its, it's coefficient is something else. Let's see if we can figure out what that is. I'll use a different color here. I'll put a big question mark in front of my, my second derivative term. Now, how did we figure out in the previous section, how do we figure out what the formula was for the linear approximation? Well, we said that there were two different ways to write the fundamental theorem of calculus. One was f of x minus f of b. And the other was the integral from b to x of f prime of x dx, except we changed the variable to a dummy variable. And I'm not actually going to go through all of that um, integration again, but I, I will say that what we got here, what our result was, is f prime of b times x minus b plus the integral from b to x of f double prime of t times x minus t dt. And if we do integration by parts again, on this integral, we get, I won't bore you with the details, but I'll go ahead and, and spell out what the result is. We get minus f double prime of t times x minus t squared times one half. Let me use a different color. There's a one half in that term. Plus one half the integral from b to x of f triple prime of t times x minus t squared dt. The uh, substitution that we did here was u equals f double prime of t and v equals negative one half x minus t squared. Uh, that 
that may not be obvious, but it, it wasn't re terribly obvious, remember, in the um, in the previous section when we did integration by parts on this first term, on this first version of the problem, right? We said let u equal f prime of t and let v equal, we had dv equals t, dv equals dt, but then we kind of added a constant. When we integrated, we added a constant. So because we want this power to be 2, we, we let the coefficient be negative a half, and we can come up with our dv, or we came up with our dv from that. Anyway, I'll leave that with you to see if you want to finish out the integration by parts to verify that this is what we get here. Remember that this is going to be minus, uh, this is u times v minus, but then we're subtracting the whole thing, so we end up distributing a negative there. If I, if I rewrite this now so that the um, I have f of x minus f of b in front again, and I subtract everything but the integral term, I get f of x minus f of b minus f prime of b times x minus b plus one half f double prime of t. Oh, I didn't evaluate this. I need to evaluate this from b to x. And I end up, when I do that, I end up with f double prime of b times x minus b, quantity squared, is equal to one half, and there's my, my new integral. And just as we called this, these first two terms, T1, or the first Taylor polynomial, we're going to call these first three terms the second Taylor polynomial. Notice that we are in degree two. If I multiply this out, I'm going to get an x squared now. And I have a second derivative. I also have a 1 half. I'm going to explain what's going to go on with that here just in, in a minute. Um, but this is my second Taylor polynomial. This is my t sub 2 of x. Oh, I don't have room to put it in there. Let's see. OK, just squeezed in that notation. This is the second Taylor polynomial, or the second Taylor polynomial for the function f based at b. You'll probably remember that we had an error that was less than or equal to. This is for Taylor polynomial 1. We had an error that was less than or equal to some number m divided by 2 times x minus b squared. Well, the error uh, for the second t Taylor polynomial is very similar. It's m divided by 6 times x minus b cubed. So a pattern I notice going on here is that this number here is one more than the subscript here. Um, one more than the subscript on the Taylor notation. And this number here is something I recognize as 3 factorial, and this one is 2 factorial. So I'm wondering if we might be able to write our error in general for any Taylor polynomial as some number m divided by n factorial times x minus b to the power 1 greater than n. So there's a question. I'm not sure about this yet, but I'm going to put it out there because I want to make the point that we are about to embark on a pattern recognition exercise, and not quite yet, but very, very soon. And recognizing patterns like that is going to be very, very useful in the, in the very near future. So the other thing I'll point out is just by way of reminder, Remember we said that 2 factorial just meant 2 times 1, and 3 factorial meant 3 times 2 times 1, and so on. It would be quite useful to take a look at a few of these and see, especially the first several, see what you get for these factorial values. This one is clearly 2. This one is 6. 6 times 4 is 24. And 24 times 5 is 120. Now, something else we should probably point out at this stage is that 1 factorial is 1. That may seem obvious, but it, it can help 
to recognize that if I follow this pattern down far enough, I do get something called one factorial. And one is the last smallest natural number. So when you multiply one by, I don't want to say nothing because that would imply zero, but that's not the case. Um, one is just its own factor here. And so the, the, what we say about one factorial is that it's equal to one. The other thing very, very useful to know about factorials is that we define zero factorial as also being equal to one. So that's an important one. It's one you just kind of have to memorize. Zero factorial is equal to one. When I saw this two and this six in my error formulas, my head immediately went to this line here and this line here. So it would be interesting to see if, for example, it turns out that for a third Taylor polynomial, I'm going to put a question mark here because we don't know this to be true, whether it's m over 24 times x minus b to the power of 4. Is that going to be the case? These two boxes are unknowns. I don't know these. I'm just, I'm just guessing. I'm making an observation about whether these patterns might hold for more than just these two. I've recognized, though, just as I'm making this video, this is completely unrehearsed, this 24 here is comes from here. That's 4 factorial, right? And this is the error for po Taylor polynomial 3. So this actually has an n value, if you will. If I'm doing e sub n, then if this was n factorial, it would be 6. And and it's not, it's one more than that. It's four factorial. So I'm gonna to add to my formula up here this question that I'm asking myself. Should this in fact be n plus one factorial? I still don't know, but that's, if the pattern holds, that's what it'll be, not n, but n plus one factorial. Okay, I've gone on enough about that for just now, but there's something else I wanna go back and look at up here. We said that this was our t sub two, our formula for the second Taylor polynomial. And we got up to here and we got to a one, we have a one half, a coefficient of one half here. I wanna point out that that is equivalent, based on my chart to the right here, as of one over two factorial, because two factorial is just two times one. Two is the same as two factorial. And in fact, I could have said that this is one over one factorial and Noticing that this is my first power uh, and my first derivative, I have a first factorial as well. That's a, an exclamation point. Really hard to see. Let's see if I can do it with an eraser. Take that out and replace it with <clears throat> minus one over one factorial. Okay, so uh, there's that, and then there's also, uh, notice that the, the first, second derivative is divided by two factorial, the first derivative by one factorial, factorial first derivative of b, the zeroth derivative of, of uh, f can also be divided by zero factorial because we've defined zero factorial as one, so this becomes one over one, and so that, that coefficient doesn't change the value of this term, just like this coefficient doesn't change the value of this term. And that makes me think, I wonder if this next term, after, after we deal with this, the second Taylor polynomial, the last term is the highest power is two, and it's divided by two factorial, whether the next one will have a power of three, a third uh, derivative and be over three factorial and so on. It turns out the answer is yes. So that's the main reason I've gone to all the trouble of showing these uh, these coefficients as being uh, in terms of factorial because as we get to our fifth and sixth and seventh terms, we're not going to want to write out the value. We're going to want to write out uh, a factorial because A, it's a lot shorter, a lot more compact notation, but B, it gives us uh, an indication as to what the pattern is, right? This is a zeroth derivative, x to the zero power, this term, and it's over zero factorial. First derivative, x to the first, one factorial. Second derivative, x to the two, and two factorial. And the pattern continues. 
We're only interested in the quadratic approximation for this video, for this section, but we are going to continue and do higher order approximations. So it's worth making an observation now about that pattern. I think I'll stop there and do the examples video in a separate, uh, a separate video. So this is a fairly short one, but it's not terribly um, taxing to add one term. In the next section, in the next video, we'll be adding um, not just the next term, but an infinite number of terms. So that video may be a little bit longer. But for now, I think we've got enough to go on for quadratic approximation, and I'll do a couple of examples in the next video.